They are widely hailed as the most important archaeological find of modern times. They are some of the founding documents of our civilization. Western civilization owes its origins to this period. This really was history's Big Bang. Always controversial, they're still at the center of a passionate debate. Discovered more than 60 years ago, mystery still shrouds, writing the Dead Sea Scrolls. Archaeologist Bob Cargill devotes much of his career to the Dead Sea Scrolls. They cause so much controversy, so much division. It truly is remarkable. The biggest controversy surrounds who wrote the scrolls. Cargill is passionate about the mystery and determined to find the answer. We've answered most of the mysteries about the Dead Sea Scrolls. The last remaining question is who wrote them? Many of us will not rest until we can answer that final question. I want to know who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Sixty years ago, the man who leads the study of the scrolls claims they're all written by an obscure Jewish sect, the Essenes, who lived at a place on the Dead Sea called Qumran. But now, some critics are challenging that theory. He did a marvelous story. He was honest, but he was wrong. Here we have a different group in the north that really says it's quite a different story. And an amazing new clue, the discovery of a cryptic text. If this inscription is deciphered, it will give us information as to who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. And forensic science is dramatically transforming the Dead Sea Scrolls story. I think on the end it will be that we get the final answer. This is where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is where the entire controversy began. In 1947, the first of the scrolls are discovered in a remote mountain cave on the western shores of the Dead Sea. The story goes, a Bedouin shepherd was tending his herd up here in these cliffs. One of his animals wandered into a cave and he tried to scare him out. So he threw a stone and he heard something shatter. He ran up to see what he had broken and he found a jar. And he found some scrolls. Mohammed Ed Dib finds three ancient lengths of parchment with Hebrew writing. The texts are revealed to be from the Jewish Bible, what Christians later called the Old Testament and from other religious works. The scrolls date from the third century BCE to the first century of the Common Era. Today, these scrolls are housed here, in Jerusalem's Israel Museum, in a specifically built home, the Shrine of the Book. The centerpiece of the shrine is the Book of Isaiah. It's a thousand years older than any other previously known copy. To me, the amazing thing about the Dead Sea Scrolls is, is it pushes our knowledge of the Bible back a thousand years. And yet, here it is. You can still read it in the Hebrew, 2,000 years old. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. I mean, these are the things I was taught as a kid. It's still there. As much as I can say, this is truly a religious experience. It's not just that they're biblical text. It's that they're the oldest text of the Bible. And these words have been speaking to generations of people, literally thousands of years. The Isaiah scroll on the shrine of the book is a replica. The real treasure, the original scroll, is kept in these vaults. This is it. This is it. This is one out of the four segments of the book of Isaiah manuscript A discovered by the Bedouins. How old is this scroll? This specific one uh -huh. 
is from the end of 2nd century BCE, around 100 BCE. And this uh, manuscript is the oldest manuscript out of the 22 copies of the book of Isaiah discovered in the Judean desert. This is the oldest biblical manuscript of the book of Isaiah on earth. It's near perfect. It's beautiful. Unbelievable. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain many biblical texts like the book of Isaiah. But there are also texts, psalms, and prophecies that didn't survive to be part of the Bible we know. Their discovery transforms our knowledge of Judaism around the time of Jesus. The great majority of the Dead Sea Scrolls are religious documents. So these scrolls teach us about the spiritual experience of human beings like us who live in the land of Israel 2,000 years ago. How they saw themselves, how they saw God and the people of Israel. So in a way, the Dead Sea Scrolls are a window through which we can have a glimpse about the spiritual experience of Jews 2,000 years ago. So this is a real archaeological miracle. Incredible. This is uh, kosher, right? Yes, of course. Kosher. Wonderful. Then one kosher ribeye, please. Fifty shekel. Fifty? That's it. The, the writers of the scrolls were obsessed with ritual purity. And these laws were in their everyday lives, just like here today in this kosher market. Thank you. The rules that were set out in the Bible thousands of years ago are still in play here today. 2,000 years ago, Judaism existed in different forms, with important religious divisions between different groups of Jews. It's important to identify the particular group of Jews who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Their scrolls give us a unique insight into the beginnings of Judeo-Christian culture. But exactly whose insights have been discovered? Who are responsible? for these documents that change the way we understand Judaism. They change the way we understand the Bible. We want to know whose legacy is this. It may not change who I am as a person, but it can tell me where I came from. More than scrolls were discovered in the caves along the Dead Sea. Bob Cargill hopes the artifacts found with the scrolls will help him discover who wrote them. These items are very rare. Uh, the dry climate of uh, the Ju Judea Desert helped us to preserve the organic materials, such as textiles, basketry items, leather. All these organic materials were kept in the caves. Finds in the caves may reveal the religious practices of the people who put the scrolls there. Let me show you an example of uh, the phylactery cases that fill in. Oh, wow. And these phylacteries are made of leather. What are these used for? For praying. To pray? Yeah, they had uh, parchment in these small uh, wow. houses, which uh, you can see here. They used it for the head, and one was used uh, to put it on the hand. Wonderful. And so they would take pieces of scroll, re really tiny scroll, yes. and place it in there exactly. and then tie it to themselves exactly. and around their head and then would pray? Yeah, and this practice, the Jewish Orthodox still do it today. S still do this today. And they continue to pray. These are the earliest ones in Israel, so we know this practice is uh, around 2,000 years. The textiles found in the caves are all plain linen. Mixing linen with other textiles, like wool, is forbidden by religious purity laws of the time. But the people who own the linen are making a political statement, too. The linen is undyed. They don't want to dress like Romans or Greeks. What does that tell us about who these people were? They were different from the other, situ the other population around them. So the, the people that produced the scrolls were not only trying to be different from the rest of society, Romans and Greek, they were trying to be different from other Jews. Yes, they were different. The finds in the caves are a clue to the identity of the scroll writers. They aren't ordinary Jews of 2,000 years ago. They are a breakaway sect. In fact, as well as biblical texts, 
the Dead Sea Scrolls also include their community rules. The community rule is obviously a sectarian manuscript, some Jewish sect with very strict rules of obedience, you know, how to behave and how to get into the group. We know that it's a sect that wrote it. The question is, who is this sect? Who are these people? Who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? Sixty years after the discovery of the first scrolls, the identity of the authors is hotly disputed. There's something about the Dead Sea Scrolls that just sparks controversy. It really causes so much division among scholars. It, it truly is remarkable. The controversy goes back to 1947, when Bedouins and archaeologists go on a mass hunt after Muhammad ed dibs discovery of the first Dead Sea Scrolls. Within a few years, many more caves are searched, and roughly 900 manuscripts are found. In 1952, Father Roland DeVoe, an archaeologist and Catholic priest from the religious order of the Dominicans, is appointed to head an international team to study the scrolls. Only scrolls found in two of the caves are discovered largely intact. Most are in tiny fragments, like these. Today, in the conservation rooms of the Israel Antiquities Authority, you get a sense of the task faced by DeVoe and his colleagues. In order to begin their work, the scholars spread them out on long trestle tables and really? they started uh, putting them together. And what you see here in front of you is actually a sample of these uh, plates. And oh, wow. eventually we ended up with over 1,260 such plates that and what, what language is this? this okay, is... this is written in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So some of the scrolls are written in Hebrew and some are written in Aramaic. Aramaic. And some, of course, are written in Greek. Right. While DeVoe's team slowly labors over the texts, others speculate about who wrote the scrolls. Since they're discovered just two years after other ancient texts revealed to be lost Christian gospels, a suspicion grows that the scrolls might give startling new information about the origins of Christianity. Was Father DeVoe and his predominantly Christian team suppressing inconvenient truths that challenge traditional church teaching? People love a conspiracy, and in the absence of hard facts, people's minds begin to wander. They couldn't help but think, there's something fishy going on here. It's not a question of conspiracies. It's a question of a massive amount of manuscripts. As we said, over 900 manuscripts. Mm -hmm. uh, there were only eight scholars that were appointed to work on them. They can't handle such a massive amount of no. uh, manuscripts. It, it's almost as if they're trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle, but they don't have all the pieces, and they yeah. don't have the picture on the top of the box. They don't know what it's supposed right. to say. The scrolls are slowly published. In a knock to the conspiracy theorists, it's revealed that early Christians did not write the scrolls after all. We now know, after having published all of the scrolls, the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls certainly were not Christians. If not early Christians, who did write the scrolls? And what can their identity tell us about the scrolls and the crucial period of history when they were written? This period, 2,000 years ago, I would argue, gave rise to Western civilization as we know it today. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are our unique looking glass back into that moment in time. The $64 million question is who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? I mean, it's like who shot JFK or what happened to the dinosaurs? Everyone wants to know who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Archaeologist Bob Cargo is determined to identify who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls transported us back beyond the time of Jesus. The Dead Sea Scrolls provide a link to a part of history that, I would argue, gave rise to Western civilization. The mystery of who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls begins on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea. The scrolls are found in caves here in 1947.
Father Roland DeVoe, leader of the team deciphering the scrolls, also excavates ruins of an ancient site here at Qumran. The 11 caves in which the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered literally surround the site of Qumran, starting approximately three uh, kilometers or two miles north of Qumran, and then coming along the cliffs behind the site. Some of the caves are located in this sort of very soft, chalky, marl terrace on which the site sits, and then going around a little bit to the southern end of the marl terrace. Ancient historians identify a Jewish religious sect living on the Dead Sea at the time, the Essenes. Did they write the Dead Sea Scrolls? Descriptions of their communal lifestyle match details in the Dead Sea Scrolls community rules. At Qumran, DeVoe unearths what he thinks are the remains of such a community. One of the strange features noted at Qumran is the number of water pools. There are 16 on the site. Would the people living here have needed so much water as was stored in all of these pools just for the purposes of survival, for drinking? Or could it be that some of the pools were used for other purposes? The pools are identified as Jewish ritual baths. DeVoe also excavates a room large enough for the Essene community to use as a meeting room. Because this is the largest room, DeVoe identified this room as an assembly hall. And because in the room adjacent to this, he found a pantry of over 1,000 dining dishes, DeVoe identified this large room also as a communal dining room. In one room, DeVoe discovers the remains of furniture. He reconstructs his scroll tables and two inkwells, a rare find in archaeological excavations in Israel. He identifies it as a scriptorium or writing room. If that's the case, we can reasonably suggest that some of the Dead Sea Scrolls might actually have been written in this room. With this evidence of a large community living next to the scroll caves, with pools for ritual bathing and scroll writing equipment, it seems like the mystery of the Dead Sea Scrolls is solved. The Essenes wrote and collected scrolls at Qumran and hid them in nearby caves. This view has been mainstream scholarly opinion for 50 years. In my opinion, the comparisons, the parallels between the information in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the archaeological evidence from Qumran indicate that we should, in fact, identify this sect as the Essenes. And I believe there can be no doubt that the people who lived at Qumran, the Essenes, deposited the scrolls in the nearby caves. Pliny, the ancient writer who first located the Essenes on the Dead Sea, describes them as living near Ein Gedi. Archaeologists are now excavating Ein Gedi. So far, they haven't found any sign of the Essenes or any religious community. Where are we here? Oh, uh, we are in the village of Ein Gedi, mm -hmm. the ancient village from the Roman time. This is a village of common people, uh -huh. probably. The people who make their living from the palm trees, as you see around. The settlement here at Ein Gedi was a, a regular residence. I mean, people lived here, they worked here, they did agriculture. Whereas at Qumran, it was starkly different. For instance, here at Ein Gedi, uh, we find no mikvahot. There are no ritual baths. Whereas at Qumran, uh, a, a little bit smaller of a settlement, you have many of them. So it seems that whoever was at Qumran was obsessed with ritual purity. Not so here at Ein Gedi. No trace of the Essenes is found at Ein Gedi. So nearby Qumran may well have been the place Pliny identified as their home, as DeVoe believed. Archaeologists digging at Ein Gedi find one powerful similarity with Qumran. Just today we found coins at the site dating right up to 68 CE, but nothing after that. This tells us that this site was occupied right up until the Romans destroyed it in 68 CE. Qumran is destroyed by the Romans in the Jewish revolt of 66 to 70 CE. 
There is evidence of this Roman destruction up and down the western shore of the Dead Sea. And it is generally believed that the Essenes living here hide their scrolls in the caves just before the Romans arrive. Was their plan to come back and retrieve the scrolls? Nearly 2,000 years pass before the scrolls once again see the light of day. But DeVoe's theories are under attack. Bob Cargill is meeting Father Jean-Baptiste Humbert, a member of the Dominican religious order like DeVoe. He inherited the task of publishing DeVoe's work. If anyone could be expected to support DeVoe's work, it might be him. Yet after 20 years of study, Humbert has reached a radically different conclusion. I understood suddenly one morning that it was totally different of the model of uh, De Vaux. De Vaux was totally honest, you know, but uh, because he was so clever, he did a marvelous story uh, without strong foundation for the interpretation. And uh, he was honest, but he was wrong. Humbert thinks DeVoe confused the archaeological evidence of Qumran with what he knew about monastic life in the Middle Ages. He wanted to find a religious community like his own at the site. Do you think he was projecting his own life on, uh, exactly. on Qumran? You exactly, think? yeah. yeah. And he, he built in his brain a fantastic story, you know. And this brain story he found on the site. Wow, so he found it in his head, yeah, yeah. and he read it into the site. He read it on the site. And, and you don't agree with that? It is impossible. It's impossible. Yeah. Humbert believes Qumran was too small and compact for a community to live in. He believes Qumran was used intermittently by a sect, perhaps the Essenes, but the scrolls were not written there. Are they responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls? For me, it is impossible. You don't think that the people there, most likely the Essenes, were responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls? No, 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 no. Cargill is learning that what he knew about some of the most important historical records ever discovered must now be rethought. Roland DeVoe was convinced that the Essenes wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran. And now the very man who took over for DeVoe says the Dead Sea Scrolls did not come from Qumran and that Qumran was something totally different. Umber's interpretation throws the gates wide open. Once again, we're asking who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Archaeologist Bob Cargill is investigating who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. He's on his way to the ancient site Qumran with Yuval Peleg. Peleg is the archaeologist in charge of Qumran. He excavated here for 16 years. Cargill wants to know if his work supports the idea that this is where the Essenes wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. When we excavated, we found uh, all the things that belong to the pottery production. Kills, damaged pottery, huge amount of uh, pottery vessels, makes us uh, thought that maybe there's something else in the, uh, the site. It's something completely different. Then Peleg began to excavate the biggest mikveh at the site. A mikveh is a pool used by observant Jews for ritual purification. Previous archaeologists saw the many mikveh pools here as evidence it was home to a large community of ultra-observant Jews. Most of the scholars are thinking that most of the pools at the site uh, are mikveh, a ritual bath, and from my archaeological opinion, this is the only ritual bath at the site. No other pools were this suitable. Only, this is the only mikveh? This is the only mikveh. No other uh, ritual bath at the site. According to Pelek, only the westernmost pool at Qumran could be a mikveh. The water in the following pools would be impure in Jewish law. If Qumran had Next just week. one mikveh, it could not be a home to a large, observant religious community. So what was this pool for? 
This is the, the last pool of, uh, at the side. Uh, all the water that entered the side finally and found the, the way to, to this area. And after excavating at the bottom of the pool, we found a layer of 30 centimeters of pure clay without any stones, without anything. According to Peleg, all but one of yeah, the pools are designed to capture and separate clay for pottery production. Yuval argues that the scrolls have nothing to do with this site. That is, you wouldn't want your scribes, very holy men, praying, uh, writing scrolls, here on a site that was used for common production of pots. According to Yuval Peleg, this site had nothing to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls. They came from somewhere else. Peleg's view that the site was a pottery factory is one of many disputed ideas that counter the traditional view of Qumran. Others have described it as a villa, a perfume factory, or tannery. It's likely that over time, different groups used the site for different purposes. There's no consensus about Qumran and whether the Essenes lived and wrote some of the scrolls here. Now forensic scientists are using modern technology to find clues to the ancient mystery. Here we have a box from Qumran and what you can see over here is the animal bones that were excavated in that area. And what I'm looking for is bones that I can extract DNA out of. The Dead Sea Scrolls are parchments made from animal hides. Dr. Gila Kahila Bargal has discovered DNA from scroll parchments and discovered that they are made from goat and ibex. Now she's testing animal bones found at the Qumran site to reveal if the scroll parchments are made from the same animals. We believe that if they had herds of sheep, goat, maybe cattle in Qumran, they would slaughter the animal, they will eat the meat, they will use the skin for either clothing or parchment. If these DNA tests show that some of the scroll parchments are made from the hides of animals found at Qumran, it will be firm evidence that some of the scrolls were made there. What we do hope at the end is to get the full profile of the goats from the parchment, the full profile of the goats from the bone, and match them together to show that we're talking about the same goats. Ink taken from one of the scrolls, known as the Thanksgiving scroll, is tested for traces of water from the Dead Sea. Traces of water found in the scrolls or in the inks can be a real clue to the place where this ink or this scroll has been produced. Water in the Dead Sea has a unique composition of the elements chlorine and bromine. We tested the ink of the Thanksgiving scroll and we found that the key elements of the Dead Sea water, chlorine and bromine, are there in characteristic relationship. Characteristic for the place of Qumran and surrounding. The test shows that the scroll is written with ink made from Dead Sea water. It's evidence indicating this scroll may have been written near the Dead Sea, possibly at Qumran. It's a tantalizing clue for Bob Cargill. He believes that archaeologists and other scientists working together will reveal who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. I cannot tell you how excited I am. For me, there's this anticipation that maybe, just maybe, there's a chance that we could solve this question. Professor Jan Gunnevig heads an international team of 130 scientists looking for an answer to who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is a scroll jar, one of the many which are found at Qumran, about 100 of them. Gunnevig tests the chemical composition of the clay in the scroll jars found in the caves. Clay has a distinctive fingerprint, a possible clue to where the scroll jars were made. We take a piece of ceramic, we grind it, we send it to a nuclear reactor where it is bombarded with neutrons. Then we can measure the chemical fingerprint of the clay of which the pottery was made. 
since there is no clay on earth with the exact same chemical composition, it is like DNA. You can point to a specific area and say this pottery was made here, that pottery was made over here. Gunaveg discovers that half of the scroll jars are made with distinctive Qumran clay. He once doubted there was a religious community at Qumran, but the forensic science is telling him otherwise. We have, I think, linked the Dead Sea Scrolls with a sectarian group who was located at Qumran. I think that a third of the Dead Sea Scrolls is written in Qumran itself, and the rest is coming in from one or two different places. The forensic science cuts through the debate and suggests that a third of the Dead Sea Scrolls were written at Qumran. But were the writers the Essenes? And did they write all of the scrolls? And how did all the scrolls come to be in the caves of the Dead Sea? Bob Cargill is in Jerusalem with fellow archaeologist Shimon Gibson. Gibson has discovered a site linked to the Essenes. What is certain is that the Essenes were here in Jerusalem because we have a gate, and we're standing here at the gate, uh, called the Gate of the Essenes. So definitely the Essenes were in Jerusalem, and why not at Qumran, uh, in my opinion? Shimon Gibson believes that the Essenes could have been the group that lived at Qumran and left their scrolls in the caves there. The Essenes might have been uh, the major group depositing uh, scrolls there. That is uh, definitely a possibility, but we must take into consideration the possibility that other groups were putting their manuscripts there as well. Gibson has been digging at Mount Zion, an ancient part of Jerusalem. And here he unearthed what could be a vital clue in identifying other writers of the scrolls. It's an amazing discovery, a remarkable cup thousands of years old. We found this cup, which is about so high, and um, uh, inscribed uh, uh, on the sides of this cup is, uh, is a text, which turns out to be a cryptic text. The only other place where we have cryptic texts uh, is at Qumran. So there's a link here between the cup and uh, Qumran. The only other place this cryptic text has been found is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Surprisingly, a tenth of the scrolls contain this unique code. To have a cup uh, from Jerusalem, uh, from the Mount Zion area, with this cryptic text, uh, similar to the cryptic text at Qumran, might uh, provide us with information as to who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Professor Stephen Fan is analyzing the cup. If he can decipher the code, it might lead to a real breakthrough. It was a marvelous discovery. It has on it lines of an inscription that actually tells us a lot about what this cup is all about. So this new technology where we can actually do lighting from all different sides in one image makes it possible to be able to move the light around on the computer screen so that we can actually see all the lines. The new technology reveals the lettering and allows Fan to decipher the code. In the cryptic alphabet, we can read Aleph, Dalet, Vav, Nun, Yud, which is the divine name, Adonai, Lord. And the second word that we have here, which says Shavti, Lord, I've returned. Some priests wrote in secret code to keep their communication with God exclusively to themselves. It was understood to be a secretive script used by the priests, non-Essene priests, in order to make a set of texts which no one could read except themselves. And the fact that we have it on this mug in Jerusalem and on these texts at Qumran shows that this was something of a, of a more secret of part of a priestly society. The use of the secret code on the priest's cup and in the Dead Sea Scrolls suggests a possible connection between priests from the Temple of Jerusalem and some of the scrolls. I think it dramatically changes our understanding of the Dead Sea Scrolls if we see them as documents produced by priests 
Gone is the Ark of the Covenant. We're never going to find Noah's Ark, the Holy Grail. These things, we're never going to see them. But we just may very well have documents from the temple in Jerusalem. It would be the great treasure from the Jerusalem temple. In the time the Dead Sea Scrolls were written, there was great upheaval in the Jerusalem priesthood. Certain factions were dissatisfied with foreign influences, so they left the temple. They could have gone to Qumran and dedicated themselves to a life of purity. It's very conceivable to see uh, a group of Jews thinking, ah, the Jerusalem temple is now corrupt, so we're going to separate ourselves and we're going to do things the way they should be. The people would have wanted to be here but they disagreed with what was going on in the temple, so they couldn't be here. They had to find something like this elsewhere. These dissident priests may have taken their scrolls with them as they left Jerusalem. So you have a group separating themselves from what they understand to be heresy. They're going to have their own ritual purity laws, and they're going to worship in a way that God is going to like them more than they like some other group, and they're going to sit here and wait for God to come to fight the battles for them, to win, and to vindicate them, to prove that they were right and the others were wrong. In this view, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls are the texts of dissident priests from the Jerusalem Temple. Those priests may have been the Essenes, or a different group of priests. A final answer might be found in the caves of the Dead Sea. Professor Stephen Fan believes the key to finally understanding the Dead Sea Scrolls mystery lies in the caves around Qumran. It was an important area where people could actually walk from east to west without really being seen by the various centuries. The scrolls were found in 11 different caves, some right next to the Qumran site, others up to two miles away. There are a lot of caves, but they have different contents. Right up here, you can see the massive lintel over Cave 11. Inside here, there were scraps of, of scrolls all over the surface, with the soil coming up to our hips here. And back there is where the major 33 scrolls were found. But this is a different set of scrolls than what we found to the south. Here, we have scrolls that deal with temple issues. If this cave had been discovered first, nobody would have ever believed that this was an Essene cave here. Really? Because this doesn't describe an Essene uh, society. Fan thinks that scrolls in this cave to the north of Qumran belong to a sect called the Zealots. His work leads him to a surprising conclusion about who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the 1950s, they came to the conclusion that all the caves along the cliffs here, including the site of Qumran, comprised one single library spread out among all these different caves. After we have looked at the content of these scrolls, we feel that no longer can be the case. What we have instead are different caves with different deposits made by different people at different times. So who in fact wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? It's not one group, but it's the various groups that existed in Judaism of the first century. And what we're seeing is the Dead Sea Scrolls is not just one library, but actually the multiple libraries of multiple groups. So when we ask the question, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? The answer is the scrolls were written by Jews, not just one specific group, but by lots of Jews. There is one event that ties the fate of all these groups with all their scrolls together. The Great Jewish Revolt. After 130 years of Roman occupation, the Jews rise up in 66 CE. The Jews were tired of being oppressed. I mean, they, they had been living under Roman occupation for so long, they began to fight back. And the Romans don't like this. And so they began to come in and suppress the Jewish revolt. 
the Romans didn't stop with wiping out the people, they destroyed the temple of Jerusalem. What you see here is, is what the Romans do. They destroy things. They literally took one of the greatest architectural masterpieces of the ancient world and knocked it down. The temple's gone, and this, this is what's left of Jerusalem. This is the main sewer of Jerusalem, the Cloaca Maxima. The ancient historian Josephus wrote that at the end of the war, some Jews hid in channels under the city and finally escaped through them. Archaeologist Ronnie Reich has been excavating Jerusalem for 40 years and has recently discovered sewers from the time of the revolt. It's an amazing find that will bring Cargill's journey to a close. Archaeologists Bob Cargill and Ronnie Reich are exploring newly excavated sewers recently found under the streets of Jerusalem. We have excavated here a narrow sample of a stone-paved stepped street going up the valley to the Temple Mount. And by the coins, by the pottery, this is clearly the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 by the Romans. Ronnie Reich believes this is one way Jews escaped from Jerusalem. This was just one way, uh, an ingenious one, to escape. Simply take the channel to the valley, the Kidron Valley, and the distance is short. In one night, you are near the Dead Sea. The escape route took refugees in the direction of the Dead Sea. It could have been used to get scrolls out of Jerusalem. So if you rescue yourself, you can rescue whatever fits in such a channel. If it's dear to you, if it's worth risking your life to do it, you take it out with yourself and out of town. You can imagine what it's like to be fleeing Jerusalem during the suppression of the Jewish revolt. They're running for their lives. They grabbed their valuable possessions, they grabbed their Bibles, they grabbed their scrolls, and they ran. And they hid those scrolls in caves, you know, all throughout the Judean desert. Some of them perhaps may have managed to come back and grab their scrolls and move on. Some of them didn't. The Romans chased them down and slaughtered them right out here on the north end of the Dead Sea. The same fate may have befallen all the custodians of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Whoever you believe wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, what's striking to me is that these Jews took the things closest to them, the Word of God, and fled with them. And their last dying act was to hide them, to preserve them, so that they'd be safe. Thousands of Jews are killed or enslaved by the Romans in the Jewish revolt. Qumran is destroyed, as is the whole of the western shore of the Dead Sea. The last Jewish holdout is the ancient fortress at Masada. According to legend, the zealots hold out here for three years. Jews fled to the south, to Masada, because they knew it was a safe place to be. The Romans laid siege to the entire mountain. They used Jewish captives of slaves to build an earthen rampart all the way to the top of the mountain. The Jews on top decided that they would rather die as free men than live as captives of the Romans. So they decided to enter into a suicide pact. Ten men were drawn by lot, and they were charged with killing all of the other Jews. Then one of those ten was chosen, and he killed the other nine. And then there was one suicide at the end. So by the time the Romans showed up the next morning, everyone was dead. The story of Masada is truly one of the greatest tragedies of all time. When archaeologists excavated Masada, 
they discovered scrolls just like some of those found in the caves at Qumran. The significance of Dead Sea Scrolls here at Masada is that it brings the entire story of the Dead Sea Scrolls to a close. We could have the final act of devout Jews fleeing the Roman persecution, taking these scrolls up here to the top, and then perishing. But they left behind the scrolls. We may very well have some Jews hiding scrolls in the caves and some Jews bringing the scrolls up here to Masada. So this ties the Dead Sea Scrolls to one of the epic tragedies in history. I went from thinking that the scrolls were written by one single group to understanding that the scrolls were perhaps written by a vast array of different Jewish groups. It really does allow me to understand the scrolls as documents that speak directly to me. Not just some group that died off a long time ago, but these scrolls still have meaning for me today.